Church, if you would please open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Today we're going to be reading what is called the Beatitudes. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 24, uh, with the addition of 24 through 26 we'll be reading today. Um, uh, we also find the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. The first question I have for us this morning is, why are they called Beatitudes? Why are they called Beatitudes? Uh, what does the name Beatitudes mean? Uh, so we call these Beatitudes because of something the church did long ago. About 300 years after Jesus was on earth, Latin had become the most popular language in the world. So a Christian man named Jerome translated the Bible into Latin so that the church could read it in its common language. When Jerome got to Matthew 5 and Luke 6, he started to translate these blessings into Latin. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are the weak, etc. Jerome took this phrase, blessed are, or blessed are, as we have the tradition of uh, pronouncing it. And he translated this phrase, blessed are, as beati sunt. Beati sunt. Beati sunt. It's getting closer to beatitude, right? Um, a little bit later on in church history, they started adding headings to each chapter of the Latin Bible. To the, the title of Matthew 5, they gave Beatitudo, which was the Latin word meaning blessedness, a chapter about blessedness. And then many years after this, in 1540, there was an English translation of the Bible called the Great Bible. And they took this Latin heading Beatitudo and turned it into English and rendered it Beatitude. So the title stuck, and the title is, of course, still around today. I have the ESV translation in front of me, and the title of this short paragraph is The Beatitudes. And that's how we know of them today. So today we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, this, this section on the Beatitudes, these blessings, this chapter of blessedness. And as we read through it, we're going to see that Luke has this message for us. Rejoice, for you have been Blessed. Again, the message we'll get today from God's word is to rejoice, for you have been blessed. We're going to see that blessed are those who seek Jesus, and woe to those who don't need Jesus. Blessed are those who seek Jesus, and in the second large section we'll see woe to those who don't need Jesus. And hopefully by the end of our time together, church, we will see that Jesus is we will see that you have much to be happy about in Jesus. We will see that you have much, much to be happy about in Jesus. So let's read Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26 together, and then we'll pray, and then we'll dive back in and look at these things a little more closely. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Church, let's pray together, having heard the word of God. Oh Lord, we thank you for these seven verses in we thank you for the blessings pronounced on those who seek you, and we rejoice in those blessings. We thank you for sending Jesus so that we can have those blessings, because without him we don't deserve them all. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that we would take these warnings of woe seriously, and we would not be like these people who feel they don't need you. We pray, Lord, that we would feel our need for you, that we would seek after you, that we would cling to you. Oh, Lord, we love you this morning. We pray that you would help us understand your word and that we would live it out. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So in these first 
five verses, we're going to see, uh, first four verses, we're going to see that blessed are those who seek after Jesus. Blessed are those who seek after Jesus. Last week, we read through Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. And we saw in that text that it was an introduction to what we call the Sermon on the Plain. And the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus' is one single sermon here in Luke, extends from Luke chapter 6, verse 20, all the way through the end of the chapter, through verse 49. Uh, so it's a, it's a longer sermon compared to some of his others that are in the book of Luke. And it happens here on the side of a mountain. I want to read that introduction to you again and remember the context that we're going to get these Beatitudes today. So here's verses 17 through 19, uh, 17 through 20. Um, and Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said. So we have this, this good introduction to the Beatitudes here. Surrounding Jesus, when he gives these, these blessings to his disciples, when he pronounces these blessings here, surrounding him is a great multitude of people from all over. Primarily and closest to him are his apostles and his disciples, and it's these people that Jesus speaks to. But even though he's speaking directly to them, we've got this context of a large multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the regions surrounding Tyre and Sidon, the seacoast, off to the north. So we've got tons and tons of people surrounding Jesus, listening to him speak to his disciples and give them instruction. Jesus starts to instruct his disciples here. In the Beatitudes, these blessings, blessed are you who are poor, who are hungry, who weep, and who are persecuted. Jesus looked specifically to his disciples and addressed them here in this sermon. Jesus begins to pronounce those blessings. And I, I want to point out to you from the text that Jesus is blessing a certain type of person here. He's blessing the poor, the hungry, the hurting, and the persecuted. Before we look at each of these blessings, where he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who weep, and blessed are you when you're persecuted, I want to take a step back and look at them uh, a little more in general and see what it is Jesus is saying here and why he pronounces these blessings. Jesus here uh, is not talking about a group of poor people and a separate group of hungry people and a separate group of persecuted people. I want to show you from the text this morning that Jesus here is referring to one group of people who are described as poor, hungry, weeping, and persecuted. So Jesus, not talking about separate groups here, but one large group, he's talking to his disciples. Look at verse 20. He says he lifted up his disciples, he lifted up his eyes to his disciples, and he said this. So first we have that specific indication. Jesus is talking to one specific group of people. Moreover, he continues to refer to those people throughout all these Beatitudes. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you shall be satisfied, talking to his disciples. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And then blessed are you, disciples, when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. So all of these designations here, these people who are poor, these people who are hungry, they weep, they are persecuted. He's describing these people who have followed Jesus and sought after Jesus, and he's designating these people as one group who have experienced these things. They've experienced poverty, hunger, weeping, and persecution for the Son of Man. There's another thing I want to show you from the text before we dive into the first beatitude. And the second thing I want to show you is that Jesus gives these people the classification of poor and hungry and weeping and persecuted. And I think, uh, of course, those things at a minimum could refer to uh, physical poverty, economic poverty, physical hunger, physical weeping. But I think so much more importantly than that, we have very clear indication in the text that Jesus is talking here about spiritual poverty. People who have an attitude and are in a state of spiritual poverty, 
who are spiritually hungry for God, who, who spiritually weep because of the persecution they know is coming, and the people who are indeed persecuted because of the life they have, the spiritual life they have in Christ. So yes, uh, these, these are words that indicate socioeconomic status, right? Poor is a word that refers to someone who's physically poor. But I think in a much more important sense, Jesus here is referring to people who are spiritually poor. Uh, we know this because the whole text of the Beatitudes is centered around, focused around, this Godward focus, this Godward center, this spiritual center. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them the attitude they must have to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So the text starts out with a heavenward focus, a Godward shift. They were persecuted and will be persecuted because they sought spiritually heavenly blessings. Um, so the heaven start, excuse me, the text starts out with a focus on heaven. Look at the end of verse 20. He said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So they are poor in such a way that they will inherit the kingdom of God. So a, a kingdom focus, a heavenward focus. At the end, we see another particular heavenward focus in verses 22 and 23. Verse 22, look at that again with me. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and are vile you and spurn your name, on account of the Son of Man. So these are not just persecuted people because of their skin color or for whatever other reason they might be persecuted. They're persecuted because they have a relation to Jesus, this, this Son of God. Moreover, in verse 23, we see an even clearer indication that all of these blessings have a heavenward, a Godward focus. Verse 23 says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. So the people who are, are blessed in this way, the people who are experiencing these particular attributes or qualities of being poor, hungry, weeping, and persecuted, they are people who will have a great reward in heaven. So the whole text points toward poor here, uh, referring to spiritual poorness, and hungry here, referring to a spiritual hunger after God. And weeping here is as weeping as people of God associated with Jesus who are persecuted, and finally people who are persecuted because of their relation to Jesus. So we see this heavenward focus and, and shift here. Jesus here is describing a spiritual state that results in a heavenly reward. If all of this wasn't enough to convince us that Jesus here is describing a spiritual state and not just a physical state, we've got the Matthew parallel that we read a minute ago in our response reading. In Matthew, uh, Jesus is specifically quoted as saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. So even more specifically, focusing these states on the spiritual realities of their hearts and the spiritual attitudes and the, the attitudes toward Christ <coughs> and toward God. So I hope we have seen from the text that all of these blessings are spiritual blessings. And uh, all of these blessings... Uh, are, are, are blessings for this attitude or spiritual attribute, spiritual poverty, spiritual hunger, spiritual weeping, and spiritual persecution. Talking of these spiritual realities is something that Jesus did often. Jesus is saying that if you are poor in spirit and know that you need me and come to me, if you are hungry for, for spiritual things, if you're hungry to know the Lord, if you, you weep now because of your connection to Jesus, then, then you will be blessed spiritually and will inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about this very same thing with a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, this guy named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He is an intelligent guy, a smart guy. He's called a Pharisee and a leader of his people, a ruler of his people. And he comes to Jesus and Jesus tells him, Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus scratches his head and says, how in the world can a grown man like me be born a second time? I'm not going to fit in my mother's womb. How can I possibly be born? And Jesus corrects him and says, Nicodemus, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about being born from above, born of the spirit, a, a spiritual rebirth, a heavenly rebirth. You need to be born again, born of the water and the spirit is how Jesus says it. 
is talking about being born from above, spiritual rebirth. Jesus tries to explain this truth to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus doesn't quite get it. And it seems that Jesus continues to focus on these spiritual realities throughout his ministry, as we saw here in Luke chapter 6. Spiritual poverty, spiritual hunger, weeping for Christ, and persecution for Christ. So church, the question I have for you today as we conclude this brief discussion of the overall Beatitudes, the question I have for you is this, have you been spiritually born again? Have you experienced what we're going to talk about a little more in depth in just a second, this spiritual poverty, knowing that you need God? Have you experienced this spiritual hunger for God, knowing that only he can satisfy the cravings that he himself has placed in you? Do you love God and trust him? Are you willing to weep and be persecuted for him, knowing that he sent his son to die for you? Church, the truth is we have nothing spiritually to offer to God. Absolutely nothing. This world has been horribly stained by sin. And when we were born into the world, we aren't just spiritually poor at birth. We are spiritually bankrupt at birth, having nothing to offer to God. We are guilty before him. We can't give him anything spiritually or bankrupt. So Jesus does something about this. The Son of God comes to earth and he teaches us that we need to be spiritually born again. Jesus says, if you know that you're spiritually poor, if you're starving for spiritual things, if you're weeping from this spiritual poverty, then come to me and be born again. That's what Jesus says. I will give you life and you will have new life everlasting if you come to me knowing that you are poor in spirit. Come to me and have new spiritual life. <clears throat> Jesus says, come to me, repent of your sins, and trust in me, and I will give you that new spiritual life. You will be born again. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead to new life, he promises new spiritual life to all those who trust in him. Amen. So the question from this brief overview of the Beatitudes, and look at what they're focused on, is this. Do you have this new spiritual life? Have you been born again? If you have not, then come to Jesus today and he will give you new life. He will give you new life. For the rest of our time now, I want to focus a little more specifically on the Beatitudes themselves. I want to see in uh, verses 20 through 23 that blessed are those who seek Jesus. Blessed are those who seek Jesus. Jesus says this in the second half of verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus is describing a people who look inwardly and recognize, realize they are spiritually poor, spiritually bankrupt before God. If they go and stand before the judgment seat of God and say, based on my own spiritual merit, I have nothing before you, is what those people would say. I have sinned against you. I realize that I'm spiritually bankrupt before a good and holy and perfectly wonderful God. God is perfect, and from him comes all true life. And we who have nothing spiritual to offer God and have no spiritual merit of our own could never stand before him and earn the kingdom of God. So Jesus is looking to a group of people, and he says, You are blessed if you look inwardly and realize you are spiritually poor before God and have no merit before him. Verse 21, he goes further to say, blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. This here, Jesus, I, I am thoroughly convinced from the text, is referring to a spiritual hunger. He's talking to people who have sought after him and come after him, and he says, blessed are you if you hunger now. Like Matthew says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. You hunger and thirst for the spiritual things that God has designed you for. If you hunger and thirst for, for me, God's son, and if you have followed after me. These are people who first recognized their spiritual poverty and said, in my poverty, I know I can't make spiritual life of my own. I need it from somewhere else. Where can I go to get it? Jesus is the place I can get it. Amen. Those kinds of people are the ones Jesus is talking about here. You recognize your poverty, and you hunger for that spiritual life that only Jesus can offer. Amen. 
These are the kind of people that Jesus talks to. And what does he say happens to those who hunger for these spiritual, this spiritual life? He says, for you shall be satisfied. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you have hungered for this and you have sought this spiritual life in Jesus, you have been satisfied mm -hmm. and you will be satisfied in Christ so much more fully and completely when he comes again on that last day and we are fully united and brought together with him. Next, he says, blessed are you who weep now for you shall Weeping all throughout the Old Testament is associated with persecution and tribulation and trial. With persecution being mentioned in the very next verse, I, and because of the Old Testament uh, background to weeping and persecution, I, I think that this, this type of weeping Jesus is talking about here is weeping because of their connection and their persecution with Jesus. You could see this weeping as weeping and mourning over one's personal spiritual state, but I think that there's a progression here to the Beatitudes. So, so they realize they're poor in spirit, they hunger after the Lord, and now that they've hungered after him, they, they weep because of their connection with him. Could very well be they're weeping over the state of their spiritual, uh, their, their, their spiritual lives, that they, they are poor in spirit. But I think the progression leads us forward to say that the weeping described here is weeping for the persecution and the trouble that they experience by being connected with Jesus. The same persecution he himself would face. Yeah. So they are, are, are poor spiritually. They sought after Christ and were hungry. And now they are associated with him. And this group of people continues to weep for their spiritual unity with Christ. And he says, uh, blessed are you when you weep now, because even if you go through persecution in this day, there is a day to come when you will certainly laugh. That in that last day when Christ comes and, and, and stands in judgment over all people, those who weep now for my sake will laugh in that day. But later we're going to see those who laugh now in this current life will weep in that day because they did not seek after him. So blessed are you when you weep now. And then finally, verse 22 and 23 contains so much, and I wish we had 20 more minutes to go through Luke, 20, uh, Luke 6, 22, and 23. Maybe we'll take the time to do that another day. Uh, but today we'll look at them and spend as much time on them as we can. Verse 22 said, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of he says, rejoice in that day, leap for joy, and, uh, leap, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Jesus pronounces a fourth blessing here, a fourth blessing on this people because they are going to experience persecution. He says, see yourselves as blessed when you are persecuted, when people hate you because of your connection to me. When people exclude you and kick you out of their circles because of your connection to me. Blessed are you when, when they revile you and spurn your name as evil. They look at you and say, you're one of those Jesus followers. You are evil. Jesus says, those are blessed. And I pronounce blessing on those people because you are just like the prophets of old whom the Father loved and the Father sent his Son for. He tells us and gives us the only specific command in these seven verses. In verse 23, he says, rejoice in that day, knowing how blessed you are. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. And why should we leap? Behold. That big, big word, behold, it draws us attention to this reward that Jesus offers. Why does Jesus call them blessed these four times? Why does he command them to rejoice and leap for joy? He does so. Behold. Here's why. Their reward is is great in heaven. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, I want to give you the greatest word of encouragement I know how to give you today. If you are connected with Jesus, if you have recognized that spiritual poverty, have thirsted and hungered after him, if you are united with him and experience the suffering he experiences, then you are blessed and you should certainly rejoice knowing that you have a much, much greater reward in heaven than any Amen. suffering you experience here on this earth. Amen. You have a wonderful reward. 
Jesus does something very interesting at the very end. He connects his disciples with the prophets. And he says, you're blessed, much like I blessed the prophets from of old, because you experienced the same suffering that they experience. In just a minute, Jesus is going to connect. We'll look at this more closely in five minutes from now. But Jesus is going to connect their opponents with false prophets, which will be a stunning reversal. But for now, Jesus is pointing to them and saying, if you're persecuted in this life, you are just like the prophets of old who have been persecuted. So the command here, brothers and sisters, for us is to know that we're blessed and rejoice in that blessing because we will have a great reward in heaven. Paul gives a great example of what rejoicing in the midst of persecution looks like. In Acts chapter 16... Let me flip back to that page. I have it tagged for you. You can listen along as I read. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 25. Paul gives us an example of what it looks like to rejoice in the midst of persecution. He has a heavenly focused mind. He has a reward focused mind. A mind focused on the blessings that come to him with, uh, because of his union with Christ. And he rejoices in the midst of beating and persecution. Look at Acts 16, verses 19 through 25. I'll read it for you in case you haven't been able to flip. Here's what Luke writes in the book of Acts. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon him, they drove them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. That is persecution on account of Christ's name, right? This is, these are the group of people that Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 6. Here's what they do in 25 when they're persecuted. Beaten with rods, feet shackled, thrown in a prison. Verse 25, here's how they respond. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They rejoice in their persecution, knowing that their persecution is not their final reward, but they've got a much greater final reward in heaven. They are rewarded with union, unity with Christ. And one day when Christ returns, they will see him again face to face and have perfect union and unity with him. So, back to Luke chapter 6, we see that single command. Uh, it's, it's a dual command, but it's, it's one particular command. Rejoice and leap for joy. And we want to, church, take that command seriously today. That's the command that Luke has for us, and that's the command I want to communicate to you all as well. Brothers and sisters, Christ commands us to rejoice because of the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. If you today can look back and can recognize that at some point in your life you knew and experienced and felt that spiritual poverty. If you have come to Christ and trusted in him, repenting of your sins, then brothers and sisters, the message is rejoice. You are blessed in what Christ has done for you on Anyone who is part of this group, who knows at some point in their life they're spiritually poor, and has that hunger and thirst for righteousness, and is willing to endure persecution for that, if you are part of that group, then brother and sister, rejoice today. You are blessed. Mm -hmm. Specifically, the blessing here is a heavenly blessing, and I think the blessing is itself God. For Christ has united us to himself and reconciled us to God, and we are wonderfully, perfectly, uh, fantastically blessed and have the heavenly blessing of, of reconciliation with God and, and the pleasure of God and the love of God because of what Christ has done and because of our union with Christ. So blessed are you, brothers and sisters. Soak in that blessing and love God more and more because of it. Rejoice today. Leap for joy. If you get a chance to go outside and Leap up in the air for joy. Go for it. We are commanded to, to rejoice and leave. 
hope, brothers and sisters, that you rejoice in Christ and in his, uh, his, his sacrifice for you, his death, burial, and resurrection, and the new life that you have in him. Finally, brothers and sisters, and we have plenty of time to uh, look at this last section. In the very last section, verses 24 through 26, we're going to see woe to those who don't need Jesus. First, we saw blessed are those who seek Jesus. Now we see woe to those who don't need Jesus. Paul is pronouncing in this section, woe on those who think they do not need Jesus. Uh, everyone, of course, needs forgiveness in Jesus. There is no one on this earth that doesn't truly need him. We all need him. But there are many who think they do not need Jesus. So many who think this. Verses 24 through 26 describe that kind of person. Look at verse, uh, I'll read all of them again, and then we'll go one by one. Verse 24 through 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Then. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you, and all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Jesus is warning his disciples of the opposite spiritual state, one of complete self-satisfaction and self-reliance. I am fine on my own. I have all of my own wealth. I have all of my own uh, materials. I have everything I need. I am full now. I lack now because there is nothing dangerous for me in the future because I have done this all on my own. This is the opposite of a person who realizes they are spiritually poor and has a uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness, a hunger and thirst for God. Let's look at verse 24. Jesus pronounces a woe, uh, the opposite of a blessing, a curse, if you will, on those who act this way. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Just like the blessings before, this is not merely talking about physical richness, uh, material material richness, right? This is talking about uh, people who think they have all the spiritual wealth they need to earn and curry favor with God. These are people who are satisfied in themselves and do not seek after God because I have everything I need. Moreover, they are full now and do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Jesus has already said, if you hunger for righteousness now, then that day when Christ comes and you are perfectly and completely united with him, in, in, uh, united with God in Christ, then you will be satisfied, fully, completely satisfied on that day when it comes. But those who are the opposite of that, verse 25 says, if you think you're full now and do not need God, then when that day comes and Christ returns, you will be hungry. Indeed, those people will be cast into hell, where they will have torment for eternity. Third, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. These are people who look to the future, who look toward that future judgment and say, Ha ha ha, I need not worry about that. I have it all on my own. You laugh now, you do not mourn and weep now in this world because of your connection with Christ. One day you will certainly mourn and weep because of your lack of connection with Christ. And then finally, woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. How many examples in the Old Testament do we have of kings seeking out false prophets to, to tickle their ears with sweet words of prosperity for the king? Kings sought out prophets, and prophets were willing to come to them and say whatever would please the king so that they would gain the king's favor. And these false prophets, Jesus uh, completely unexpectedly associates these false prophets with people who seem to be so spiritually righteous in his day. Images of the Pharisees must have flashed across Jesus' mind and across the minds of the disciples when they hear this. These are uh, the, 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 the Pharisees are the people who were most well spoken of in their time. These people who thought that they had righteousness of their own through following God's law. And Jesus says, if you think you can do this thing all on your own, and if everyone speaks well of you for how righteous you are in yourself, 
woe to you. You're just like those false prophets whom God has condemned and cast into hell for eternity. So Paul gives, uh, not Paul, excuse me, Jesus gives a fierce warning to his disciples here. He's speaking directly to his disciples. He says, blessed are you if you act this way, and if you have this attitude, if you have this mindset, spiritual hunger after me. But woe to you, disciples, if you are like those in this world who do not hunger after me, who do not thirst after me. So the last piece of application from this Church is this. Beware. Watch out. Do not develop this kind of confidence, self-confidence in spiritual matters. Christ has given his righteousness to you, clothed you in his righteousness. The only merit you have before God is the righteousness of Christ accounted to your account. You have not earned or gained any spiritual righteousness of your own. And if you try to rely on your own spiritual righteousness, if you go forward from that day when you were saved in Christ, if you go forward from that day and, and stand on your own and do not rely on him and do not continue to hunger and thirst after him, then Jesus pronounces great woe and great curse upon you. We do believe from Scripture that once God saves someone, gives them new spiritual life in their hearts, that nothing can take that spiritual life away. No tricks of the devil can take it away, and no sin on your part can take away that true life from true faith in their hearts. But the warning here, I believe, is still to the disciples. And he points to the people who are opposite them and says, this is a warning to you. These people are cursed. Don't be like them. Don't be like them. So church, do not be like those who have no hunger and thirst after righteousness, who believe they can stand on their own before God, who laugh now, looking to the future, saying, I'm going to have everything I need to stand before the judgment seat when Christ comes. And then finally, if the whole world speaks well of you, because there's no indication you're connected with Christ in any way, and Jesus says, whoa, beware, watch out. Do not be like those people. Again, in verses 24 through 26, I do think Jesus is referring to one group of people, not separate people who, who, who think they're spiritually rich and a separate group who thinks they're spiritually full, but one group who feels this way. And Jesus warns the people against that. And the, in church, the warning for us today is just the same. Do not become spiritually arrogant, but rejoice instead. Because of the righteousness that clothes you, the righteousness of Christ, by which you have reconciliation with God and heavenly blessing. Do not rejoice in your own righteousness, but rejoice in what Christ has done for you, the righteousness he has won and given to you by his death, burial, and resurrection here in this life. So church, finally, as we close, rejoice, for you have been blessed. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Let's praise the Lord, having heard from his word this morning. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. In Christ, we are reconciled to you, God, and we have perfect spiritual blessing in you. You have saved us, Lord, and you promised that one day in the future when Christ returns, we will feel the full effect of that true salvation we have in our hearts. We look forward to that day. When we get to experience the fullness of the heavenly blessing you have for us, we get to see you face to face. We thank you for the experience we have of that now, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit in our hearts, a foretaste of the good blessings that are to come. Help us to rejoice in that blessing of the Holy Spirit. Help us to rejoice in that blessing of the Holy Spirit that we first saw at Pentecost and now we all see today, Lord, in our hearts if we trust you. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of any who are here that do not have that new spiritual life in them. Oh Lord, please convict them of their sins. Help them to realize they're spiritually poor before you and have nothing to offer. They've rebelled against you, Lord. Help them to see that. Help them to hunger and thirst for you and to turn toward you and cling to you and to never let go. Oh Lord God, we love you. We honor you and praise you. Help us to be obedient to your word and to submit to your word and help us to watch out 
so that we don't become like those that you pronounce oral on in Luke chapter 6. Oh Lord God, again, we rejoice in the blessings you've given us and praise you for those blessings. Yeah. You are a God worthy of praise. Yeah. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.